Coming live Hello. from Boston, Massachusetts, USA is our guest this evening. Welcome to this very special edition of the KJ Masterclass Live, the show which ensures that you profit from your time spent here with experts, either through their industry insights, information, or simply learning from them. And today we have Paul Hemphill. He's a popular TV guest, author, speaker, videographer, and he is energizing student personal growth with U.S. history. That's for the U.S. Welcome to the show, Paul. Thank you, AJ. And by the way, could you be a little more enthusiastic? <laughs> yes, I will try. I will try indeed. I will try it because what I'm going to draw is certainly going to be you know, enthusiastic to you. And what you are going to talk will be a lot more enthusiastic to people, not just in the U.S., but all across the world. So exactly. we'll be talking about, you know, how to use stories, how to use history as a teaching tool. My first question to you, Paul, is uh, you, you see, you talk about using history and, and uh, leading to personal growth and benefit and all that stuff. Normally, this sort of things are talked by, you know, political aspirants who want to, you know, let's make the U.S. great again. Let's talk about, let's be great again and utilize this. And I, I, if I understand the U.S. elections are very much near. So are you, are you running for the U.S. president when you talk about these things and when you are talking about energizing uh, your student personal growth with your history? What is it about what you do and why you do? Yeah, the, the thing that, that animated me, uh, AJ, is the fact that uh, a lot of people will tell me that they never liked history when they were in high school. And I said, it's not that you didn't like history, it's the way you were taught history. In other words, you were taught to learn facts and figures and how to memorize dates and speeches and all of that. And, uh, and students were not relating to those things because th there was no emotional connection to the events that they were forced to study. Whereas you can make an emotional connection with something in a science class or a math class or a, a literature class. But in a history class, there's no emotional connection there. And, and, and I discovered a long time ago that the way to make an emotional connection with any topic is to use a story. And we all love stories. And the reason why is because we are emotionally connected to the subject about which the story is being told. And it's that connection that helps us to re not only remember uh, the fact that we are learning, but also to use that fact if it's relevant to our needs at that moment. Right, right. So why is it that you do what you do? Because ah. uh, in, in present times, people are not, not much interested in stories of the past, especially a lot of the young generation, a lot of people complain. And mostly a lot of people want to spend their time on stories on Instagram, on Facebook. Right, right. right. The, or the, any, uh, any other, but that's about the, uh, uh, about the history. And it's not just about the U.S., I think this phenomenon is very much a global one. So that is why I asked, what what is it that you do and why do you do that when you know that the discussion things are very much different than what yeah. you want? Yeah. Uh, the reason I, I do it is because <clears throat> I learned a long time ago that teenagers especially uh, have a, uh, suffer from a lot of low self-esteem. and Parents are, are at a loss as to what to do. The schools don't do anything about elevating the self-esteem of our kids to help them believe in themselves. And so what I do is I go to American history, some true stories in American history, to prove to these kids that they have every right to think very highly of themselves, of their capabilities and abilities. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. There was a young girl... Uh, during a very famous Civil War battle here in the United States in 1863. And all she did was tend to the needs of the wounded and dying during this battle. Now, she didn't know what to say to these guys 
All she did was carry a tin cup of cool water to give to them while they were lying flat on their backs on the ground. But these guys were looking up at her and thinking, you know, that's my wife, that's my sister, that's my mother up there. And as a result, she was able to give them, or, or I should say, help them cross what I call an emotional bridge of hope over which few of us adults could cross alone. And some of these men were able to sur survive as a result of her attention to their needs in the, that given moment. So what that story really says to us is that even a child can save a life. Even a child can keep hope alive where there is none. <laughs> And, and that's what our kids need to know about themselves so that they have value now, not 20 years from now, but now. Right, right. And I guess this is not just about the U.S. Everywhere people can learn from the history. But then, uh, Paul, a lot of teachers want to use the history stories uh, to uh, help uh, their students learn things about personal development, self-care, and a lot of other things uh, that are possible uh, with, with history stories. Any story in, in that fact, but history stories are about real people. How do you choose history stories? Because history is about the past. And one man's, you know, it's like one man's hero will not be another person's hero. And now uh, nations... Uh, the formation of nations and and with that federal structure, but the and 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 state structure, a lot of cohesion has come in. But characters from the past, if you talk about them, then people may have different views about them. So how do you do it? What would you like to tell teachers in terms of using history uh, personalities to help their students learn, and which creates positivity and not some rift about okay this is what is uh, that this is what this person was not about and this this is what he or she was about how do you do that yeah it's 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 quite easy actually and uh, but i think that teachers have the problem of not seeing um, the obvious in plain sight uh, let, let me give you another example there was a uh, teacher that i approached a history teacher who had been teaching history for 20 years. And I said, uh, so what is your specialty? He said, the Civil War. I said, oh, gee, that's great because that's, I do a lot of Civil War stuff. And I said to him, I said, uh, what can a what can a 13 year old learn from what Robert E. Lee did during the Battle of Gettysburg? And he was stuck. He, he had no idea. That's what I'm talking about because that's not the way he teaches history. Okay, so I told him that there was a man at Gettysburg who made a disastrous decision that cost the lives of about 6,000 men within an hour, an hour and a half. And when that fight was over with, that man went to his troops and said, you know what? This is my fault. This is all my fault. And what leaders today will say that it is their fault for making a mistake? And so what can an eighth grader learn from what Robert E. Lee said in that moment? And that, <laughs> I always like to call it, you're going to have your, what I call the Robert E. Lee moment. When you're standing in front of a mirror and you're looking at yourself <laughs> and, you're, and you're saying, I really blew it this time. I, I, this, this, is, this mistake that I made was my fault. And the effect of that on an eighth grader basically says that your admission of that mistake reduces your personal stress. Uh, it avoids the need to justify a wrong decision. Uh, it increases your credibility. It builds trust. Uh, it sets the tone for open communication. And it makes you a lot more approachable. Wow. I mean, an eighth grader could learn that from Robert E. Lee. Yes. And that's how you make history relevant. That's how you make it meaningful. That's how you make it personal. And if you don't make history personal, it's not relevant. And these kids, no matter what country you live in, are not going to relate to it. They're not going to take it seriously. Right, right, Paul. But then times have changed. You see, those were people of 
of character. They had the strength to admit something. Today, people are not ready for the consequences. They don't yes. want to leave their, yes. leave their positions. Leave their positions of power. People talk about uh, about imposter syndrome in, in, in our workplaces. A lot of them are imposters. How would you tell them about to take responsibility for their actions? And that's why you find so much of toxicity in our workplaces. A lot of questions about leadership and you know this has come to the quite uh, the great resignation and the quite quitting so in terms of the present day how would you tell leaders in terms of what they can learn from history how they can you know have that uh, that courage to stand for the right take decisions which which not only impacts their company positively but also a lot of young people who will get that message that, okay, it is not about, you know, a lot of people do take sometimes, you know, and many a times it is about when there is a camera. You know, it's like when you do a charity, you want the camera to be there. When you do some good work, you want to take pictures, even with a beggar. This has become an issue. How do you be a man of character without gaining publicity out of it, but actually for the sake of being the man that you are really and for the man that you would want that people to know about. I, I love the question, AJ. There is a man um, uh, in our history, his name was George Green, and he uh, did some terrific uh, things during this battle. And uh, he was able, for example, to uh, do things in anticipation of what he believed was going to happen. His men didn't really believe it because they were so far removed from the actual battle, but he proved his point later. But this was a man that, that never took credit for anything. Uh, he always gave credit to his men uh, for doing what they did. And as a result of giving credit to others for, for what you are being led to believe was your achievement, uh, again, increases your standing uh, with the community, with your country, if you're a real leader, and, uh, and, and accepting the fact that you don't have all the answers. So that humility is a key factor of leadership, being able to accept the fact that you're not perfect, that you're not infallible, and that you do depend upon others, especially your subordinates, uh, for answers. Because in any situation, the right answers to any problems can come from the bottom up. Okay? It doesn't have to come from so-called management and leadership. We are all leaders instinctually. That's why I say that leaders, we are all born leaders. We just don't know that we are leaders until later. So leadership is not a franchise of the few, like business schools and military academies. We all exercise what I like to call an influence. We can influence people for better or for worse. And uh, right now, for example, I'm acting as a leader, and AJ, you're acting as a follower because you're following exactly what I'm saying. But you're also acting as a leader because you are, in essence, forcing me to follow what your question is all about. So it's very, leadership is very fluid. Right, right, Paul. So let's let's come down to uh, something called storytelling in a different form. You moved from the army when you retired from there, if I understand, uh, in, in Vietnam. You have served in Vietnam and you were awarded the Bronze Star Medal for Meritorious Service and also received the Vietnamese Cross of Calendar. And then you move to the um, to the marketing and advertising side. And there the storytelling changes. Many a times, storytelling changes into narrative for one, and especially in a political atmosphere, especially in a business atmosphere. As I talked about the US elections, a lot of elections keep on happening about uh, around in the world, you know. And then the storytelling changes into narrative. How do you decipher that okay this is actually not a story but this is actually a narrative which has been which is being served and which has which has less of truth but more of you know ingredients 
which has to enhance our trace like it is about social media. How, what would you like to talk about this part of, you know, where, and several times history is taken into consideration or brought into these narratives. How would you like to uh, ensure that the proper history is, is being learned by students and, and especially would you like to, how would you like to give the message to people who are using it for small gains, All maybe right. for good election? Or maybe for one more client. How does it work? Yeah, the I, right narrative and the right story is happening and not ne nothing negative about it. Well, AJ, there's nobody out there. You cannot find a source anywhere in, in the country or in the world that actually is doing what I am doing. In other words, if you go to Prager University, which is very popular here in the States, that raises over $44 million a year, uh, in, in contributions in order to make their videos free. And they're very political, they're very, uh, I should say not political, but they're very uh, conservative, very pro-American, all of that. And they do an awful lot of storytelling and they keep their stories under five minutes. And so the idea here is to uh, tell teachers that there's a, there is a source that they can go to and I always have these teachers go to my website and I tell them, imitate what I do. You don't have to use my materials. Just watch what it is that I do and simply imitate it in your own classroom so that your students will do exactly what's in the video. So that all of a sudden your history class and you as a history teacher, you'll be the most popular guy in school because the kids will look forward to going to a class where the class is all about them, not about history, facts, and figures, and all of that. It's about them that uses history, facts, and figures to give their lives meaning today. And that's what I do. And I don't see anybody doing it, not even Prager you. Absolutely. So how is it that you do what you do? What is your method? How Can you help us understand from the start to the finish so that people can learn about the tricks of the trade that only you are doing. Yeah. The easiest part, uh, AJ, is just somebody to go to my website and look at a couple of samples of my videos and you'll see exactly how I do it. Exactly. It doesn't take a rocket science to figure what it, what it is that I do. And it's very, I like to keep things simple. You know, I, I uh, somebody asked me one time, how do you, how are you able to figure out these things when nobody else does? And I say, well, look, you know, I, I studied philosophy when I was in college and philosophy helped me to to be able to reduce the complicated to the simple. And just to give you an example, when I have people come to my house during the fall uh, period of, of time, you know, the trees are, are changing colors and all of that. And I have people come over to the window and I ask them, well, what is it that you see? And everybody gives me the same answer. Oh, Paul, the colors are beautiful. The leaves are wonderful. And no one ever tells me the answer I want to hear. And the answer I want to hear is, uh, I see the window. Oh, well, what does that got to do with anything? Well, I always like to say, if, if it weren't for the window, you wouldn't be able to enjoy the beautiful colors that you see beyond the window. So you have to see beyond uh, the the uh, what it is that you're experiencing and, and look more deeply into what it is that you are experiencing and you'll discover, wow, I, I didn't know I could do that. And and everybody can, can discover things on their own if they just are patient with themselves and are focused on what it is they want to do. So it's pretty easy. It's pretty simple. Right. You make it sound simple. As you said, your, your, your understanding of philosophy, your study... So, you know, you utilize it to make it, make yeah, it yeah. things it's, simple. So, and it's fun and it's a lot of fun and, and I'm passionate about what I do. I love what I do. I get up in the morning and I, I say to myself this morning, I can't wait to be interviewed by AJ this morning. <laughs> and so, uh, you know. right. This is, this is just the beginning. There are many, many interviews that will happen in the future with America's oldest team. Why do you call yourself, or, or others call you the America's oldest team? What's well, the story behind it? I used to work with high school students for about 20 years. 
And uh, I always used to tease my students about about things, and they, I'd get them to laugh, you know, all that. And so one day I was invited to a uh, one of my students invited me to a party she was having with her other her girlfriends, and uh, and so this girl said, uh, "Hey guys, uh, I want you to meet Mr. Hemphill. He is America's oldest teenager." <laughs> <laughs> and so, and so then it stuck. You know, it's been with me all these years, and that's why I have a lot of fun with it. Because you know, these kids need to know that somebody relates to them, other than uh, the mother and father that they don't like, that they don't care to listen to, because yeah, they're my mom and dad, so they don't know anything. But you know, I can repeat the same thing the mother and father says, and they think I'm a genius. You know, wow! Did you hear what that guy said, Dad? And dad's saying, yeah, I told you like 20 times of the same thing. So uh, <laughs> you know how it goes, right? <laughs> right, right. Yeah. And so what, what I see is, is, Paul, is that not only students can learn from, from their history, but American students especially can learn from your life, from a lot of things that you have done, that you are doing, the many books that you have written. Tell us about your books, you know. Uh, uh, so that, you know, people can get hold of them. Oh, yeah, I, I, I have a great story for you. I, uh, my, the first book I wrote was called Why You're Already a Leader. And it wasn't selling very well. I mean, it was being purchased by management type people. And, and so one day I get this phone call from a guy in Pittsburgh. And he said, look, I, I just loaned your book to a couple of teenage girls here in Pittsburgh. And they came back to me and said, you know, we really love the content of this book, but the title is terrible. <laughs> and so the guy says, well, what should the title be? And so the girls told me, he says that he, sh he should rename it Inspiration for Teens. Well, I figured, well, the other, the old title wasn't working, so I'll try this one. You know, I, mean, I didn't know if it was good or bad. I had no way of knowing. So I got a new artist. I got a new title. I got a new cover. And as soon as I put it on Amazon, the sales went through the roof. I mean, the parents started buying it. They were writing the reviews. But I noticed something that disturbed me. The kids weren't writing the views, and I didn't know if they were re reading the book. So I thought, hmm, what's a teenager's favorite way to learn anything? What's their favorite method? And it's video. So I knew I had to convert my book to video so that... I would be exactly where teenagers are on a screen for nine hours a day. So if I can get two minutes or five minutes on their screen time, and that's all they'll need to get inspired by something that I have already created, wow, that's huge for me. So I don't even care if they don't get the book or read the book, but they will watch the videos. Absolutely. Absolutely. A lot of people like to consume information in the form of videos. And that's 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 nice. That's why we are going live video first. Then right. this whole thing will go on video audio and then also on text on Substack and medium. So that that's nice. You see, uh, uh, you can do get things done the way people want to consume. You exactly. can get. Yes, you can yeah. get, get kids to love American history but how do you get the kids to love broccoli i would like to understand that they would watch the videos because the videos are about them it's all about them you know the story about the 15 year old girl who saved the lives of these guys at during this battle and she didn't know what to say or what to do with these guys she knew nothing about psychology uh she was only 15 years old but she she exercised a tremendous form of leadership, the best form of leadership, which is the most important element of leadership, and that's listening. And that's what she did, and that's what she accomplished, and that's what saved the lives of a few men during that uh, battle. And, and that is something that every teenager can wake up to tomorrow morning and say, wow, I didn't know I could do that. It sounds so simple. Yes, it is so simple. Why do we have to complicate things? <laughs> okay. Right. And right. so, uh, and so that's why if if people can uh, 
get onto my Rumble and YouTube accounts, uh, particularly Rumble, uh, they'll be able to subscribe to my videos and they'll get one of my videos at, like every Wednesday at three o'clock Eastern time US. And they'll see something different, something that they can learn from. And, uh, and over time, by the way, what's interesting, AJ, is that over time, these videos will have a subtle effect of creating a bond between the parent and the student because the parent and the student will watch the videos at the same time. I always suggest that. And there are questions at the end of each video that, that, get, that makes the student relate back to the lesson, back to the story as to how it relates to them. Okay. But I say to the parents, I want you to make sure that your students answer the questions first and then you answer the questions. And what happens is the student learns something about mom and dad they, they, were, they never knew before. And the parents learn something about the students that maybe they didn't know before. So the bonding mechanism that's implied in this program is wonderful. We just never expected that to happen. We did not expect it. Right. Right, Bob. So tell us about your uh, this. Uh, you are the chairman of American Educator Education Defenders. Tell us about this so that you know uh, people can know about this. Yes, and then we are a non part of it if they want to. Be. Yeah, we are a nonprofit organization that's dedicated to helping uh, teenagers believe in themselves and in their country. That's my mission statement right there. And uh, we uh, we need to raise funds. We have a uh, page our, on our website on the uh, first page at the top of the page there's a little uh, button that says reward and so when you donate to us and help us pay for our videos uh, we reward you with a gift that's that's commensurate with the donation amount that you gave and a lot of people really like getting something in return for a contribution so uh, it's it's uh, I will tell you that uh, I have been very neglectful in not asking uh, for people to contribute because I hate asking people for money. I just it's just instinctual with me, but I have to. I, I do need help, and if people can give me help and go on my webpage and and uh, click on the word reward, that would be so appreciated. Yeah. Absolutely. So Absolutely. that's that's how we survive. We survive on. On what people give us, and we're, we just started. We just started a, a new uh, uh, donate. I shouldn't say donation contribution campaign a few weeks ago, and I haven't really marketed it or have been aggressive with it because, again, uh, it's my fault that I am not aggressive about it. I guess that's just the way I am. But people tell me, hey, Paul, you got to do it. People want to help you, so uh, if, okay, uh, I'd love to have people help me. <laughs> Right. Obviously, a lot of people want to reach out to right. help in the right causes. And, and you, so how do people connect with you in case they want to help? They want to know more about your books. Yeah, they, they can know uh, more about your videos. How yeah. do they do that? Yeah, the website is, is, is great. And when you get to the when you get to our website, which is American Education Defenders dot com, when you get there, you can go to the bottom of the page and I'm going to give you something free you're going to get access to 10 colorful graphics that you can print out and put on your refrigerator or put on the wall in your son or daughter's room or wherever. Uh, and they're inspirational items that take maybe 30 seconds to read, but they're nice inspirational reminders of what it is that you as a person are capable of doing or acknowledging about yourself that you didn't know before. And uh, so we like to, like I say, uh, AJ, I like to keep things simple. Go to the website, uh, click to your heart's content, <laughs> and and uh, and we would just ask you if you can uh, make a minimum contribution. Uh, we'd we'd love to hear from you, and uh, uh, that's pretty much it. I'd be talking too much, AJ, if I went any longer. Not, not at all. There is so much to talk. There is so much to learn from you. This is one simple episode. So people will have to come to your website, to all the resources that you provide, your videos, your templates, your images that they can put on your on their refrigerator. And I would be happy to 
share the links on the YouTube description on the show notes description. That will be my little contribution uh, for, for this. And, and, you, and anything else that you say, Paul. As I said, this is just a small, uh, small episode and everything uh, has to end. But my last question to you, Paul, is, is that to understand from you, you have had such an active life from uh, from the army to the Vietnam to the advertising and marketing to what you are doing and you straddle across the history and bring nuggets of information to the present generation. My last question is to understand, Paul, is that what is it that you seek for yourself now? I really seek the satisfaction of knowing that young people in this country, in India, anywhere, will look at my videos and say, wow, I'm a better person now that I've watched these videos because I can use this information not 20 years from now. I can start using this information today, now. And everyone needs to know that their lives have value. And, and, uh, and especially our kids, because our schools are not teaching our kids that they have value. Uh, parents are working too much, too many hours. They don't have the time to talk to their kids. So how, where do the kids find value for themselves? And if all it takes is to watch my videos so that these kids can look at these, uh, look up at their screens or and say to themselves, wow, I didn't know I could do that. That's that's fantastic. And it's a third party source, you see. It's not their mother and father telling them, you know, you're really talented. You're really a great kid. Well, they hear that all the time. But do they believe it? Well, maybe they do. Maybe they don't. But if they hear it from someone else with proof that they're terrific, that they're great, that makes all the difference to me. Absolutely. And that's what makes the difference. Yeah. And you are making the difference, a whole lot of difference to not only the people in the U.S., but all across the world. We hope so. And you your video, you your videos will keep on spreading the message of storytelling and keep on reverberating on the internet. Thank Highway you. today, Thank tomorrow, yeah. and beyond. Thank you so much, AJ, for this opportunity. I, I, I am so thrilled that uh, we, we were able to get together and and uh, perhaps again, sometime other time, we can, we can do this again. Absolutely. Absolutely. On this note, it's a wrap on this very special edition of the KJ Masterclass Live. Thank you so much indeed for joining us. Thank you, AJ. Good night.